when I saw who was introducing me, you know, I said, he, I should be introducing him because uh, a lot of my success I owe to people like Admiral Clemens because, and I'll talk more about it as I go on, but intelligence has no role other than to support the warfighter. That's our sole mission. And believe you me, the admirals and the marine generals will let you know if you weren't supporting them very well. <laughs> I'll start out with a little known story. It happened uh, just after the attack on 9-11. The head of the CIA at the time uh, said, you know, we need to get these intelligence people out from behind these cubicles. They're getting all fat and slow. We, we want to make some real ninja warriors. We'll bring in some Navy SEALs and Army Rangers and teach them how to go out and be combat intelligence ninjas. So the program was going well. And then the person who was in charge of it said, sir, We've got one slot open, and we've got three candidates, and they're all equal. We can't make up our minds. Uh, there are two men and one woman. Would you come up with some kind of uh, final test for them, you know, to help us decide who should get that last slot? So he said, sure. So the first guy came in. He's a man. And, uh, Admiral, you'll probably see uh, some some. Uh, the famous Admiral Rickover would do the final test for a lot of the people in the submarine program. Exactly. So that kind of sets what I'm saying a, a little bit in a way. So he looks at the van. He said, you know, when we were doing your background investigation, we found out your wife was working for Al Qaeda. We got her in that door behind there. Here's a gun. Save the taxpayers some money and go in there and kill her. So he goes in there, and he comes out in about 30 minutes, and he's crying. She says, Hollywood was right. You people are crazy. <laughs> she doesn't even know how to spell Al-Qaeda. He says, I guess I don't have what it takes. I, I got a good lawyer. Second guy comes in. Same thing happened. He comes out. He's crying. He goes, she's the mother of my children. She says, you people are sick and crazy, and I shouldn't be part of this organization. I'll take our chances in the court of law. And the woman comes in, and of course, it's her husband behind the door. So he does the same thing. And then he hears some shots fired <laughs> and a lot of thumping and bumping. And she comes out and says, some idiot put blanks in this gun. I had to beat him to death. <laughs> well, let me see if I can work this. This is supposed to move the slides. Did it work, or did I turn them off? Oh, I see. There we go. In the military, uh, we have this thing uh, where we tell you what we're going to tell you, we tell you, and then we tell you what we told you. So I think I missed one. Yeah, here we go. Here's my outline. I start out with my core beliefs, my story, and also in the military, there's this principle we call lessons learned, and that is whenever you have a major operation, you study it, what went good, what went bad, and what can you do in the future. So that's the format I'm going to do for this. And then at the end, I'll tie it all together with a real story this time. I always say one of these days the CIA is going to find out I'm talking about them and come get me. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll end with one story, a true story. My core belief is for the workplace one team, one fight. When you become part of an organization, you become a part of a team. It doesn't matter if you're purple or your hair is purple or blue. If you're a member of the team, then you deserve the respect on the one hand of the other team members. And from your perspective, you deserve to figure out how to be the best team member you can. So my principle that I use is just as an athlete, in order to stay fit, you have to do certain things physically, eat a certain way, exercise a certain way. To be successful in the workplace, you have to be mentally fit. And somebody told me when I first started speaking on that topic, they said, Gail, that's too easy. You know, it doesn't make any sense. I said, simple doesn't mean easy. Everybody knows that in order to maintain your ideal weight, you have to 
use up more calories, calories than you take in. Does that not sound simple? Then why is the average size, clothes size of an American woman now <laughs> size 16? Because it's, it's not easy, and you have to constantly work at it. Some of my initial challenges, if you see me looking down, I'm looking at uh, new technology. Usually when I speak, I have to have a cheat sheet in front of me of what's on the slide, or I spend half the brief going. <laughs> now it's down here, and I can see it without my glasses. Woohoo! <laughs> so that's why I'm staring down here. Now, when I first joined the Navy, it's going to sound, it was 1973, which I'm sure to some of you go, oh my God, she's that old? Yes, I turned 68 this summer. And <laughs> this is what 68 is supposed to look like. So uh, the Navy had a terrible reputation um, in the midst of Vietnam, there, you know, there was drug use and there were race riots on aircraft carriers. Um, yeah, imagine that. Imagine in today's environment, race riots. And, and women, uh, the role of women in terms of uh, non-nurses, the prime, most women in the military were the nurses, but non-nurses, there were only 400 women officers and 1,400 women enlisted women. And in the midst of all this controversy, we got the youngest CNO in history, Admiral Elmo Zumo, a man uh, that I think hasn't gotten the due he deserves. And he said to the public, he says, I know we're not perfect, but what I need to do is have you come join us and help us fix some of these problems. We want you to be part of the solution and help us. The other thing he did at the time was if you were in the Navy, he made you have uh, what we called, he had this training, and it was touchy-feely training. And they had to have at least one minority person in there, and you had to tell each other why you were intolerant of each other's ethnic background or religious background. And we said if we weren't racist and prejudiced before we went into that class, we sure were after we left it. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite, I still remember this to this day, uh, one of the guys who happened to be white said, what is it with black guys? And they're always touching their, their fist. Why can't they just shake hands like everybody else? So to this day, when I see men of all ethnic backgrounds going and greeting. <laughs> so for me, uh, I should start out with my story as to how that a girl from Newark, New Jersey, who had no connections and all the men in the family were in the Army, how did I end up joining the Navy? Well, when I was five years old, I was sitting down watching a movie, what my father called Wing and a Prayer. It starred Donna Michi, and uh, it was about the aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise, after the attack on Pearl Harbor and before the Battle of Midway. And at the big climatic scene, Donna Michi stood up and he gave the pilots an intelligence briefing. And so I said to my father, I said, Daddy, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And my father had been in the Army in the aftermath of World War II when it was still segregated racially. So he could have killed my, my dream right then and there. Instead, he looked at me and said, this is America. You can be whatever you want to be when you grow up. And I became the first woman in history to do it. So I say to your parents out there, when your five-year-old child tells you something, listen. And I'm sure my parents thought I was weird because uh, whenever it, Anchors Away came on in movies, I'd stand up and march around the house. <laughs> People complain about, you know, the football players taking a knee. Imagine your little five-year-old daughter. <laughs> but my parents were very tolerant of me. But... Uh, I spent so much energy, and I'll say a little bit more about how I got the, because it's actually my idea to the Navy. I guess I could tell that part now. When I, I got to the intelligence training school, it had just opened up for women. So I really did join the Navy on a wing and a prayer, because the recruiter said Admiral Zumo is opening up all these fields to women now. In fact, the first four of the first eight women aviators that the Navy was going to train to be pilots came through in my class in women officer school. And those women weren't normal. They were all nearly six feet tall. They looked like 
models. They were followed around by media cameras all the time. And, and then one of them was like 19 years old, had a master's degree in Purdue from aeronautical engineering, and she already had 1,000 hours commercial flight time. So there was the rest of us. <laughs> we said, oh, this is terrible. We look really ugly compared to then. So right when I was going through Women's Officer School in Newport, Rhode Island, it opened up the intelligence program for women. And so it was so new that numbers two and three, I was the fourth, number two and three were still going through the program. So the first day of the course, we had a Navy lieutenant who was in charge of, uh, you know, mentoring us and telling us what to do. And the first job at the time, and I think still for a naval intelligence officer, was in the aviation squadron. So he's going around asking the guys what kind of squadron they want to be in, fighter, bomber, so forth. But he kept ignoring me. And so I kept waving my hands. I said, what about me? You know, what about me? Why don't you ask me something? And he looked at me and he said, you don't belong in the Navy, let alone in an aviation squadron. So I tell people, I said, I was channeling Whoopi Goldberg before she was Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> so I looked at him and said, well, you can say whatever you want, but everybody knows that black people are superior sexually. <laughs> and the other guys in the class said, that's not true. It's Italian men. Let me take you out tonight. I'll show you. <laughs> And that kind of broke the ice, and so the next night, I went home that evening, and my roommate, I, I hate to give another service credit for anything, but my roommate was a woman going through the Air Force training program, and they were sending Air Force women intelligence officers to support squadrons in Vietnam. So I came back the next day and said to that same Navy lieutenant, I said, why can't I go to one of the Navy's land-based aviation squadrons? Because when they deploy overseas at the time, it was against the law for women to serve on board a ship that was considered a combatant. And since most of the Navy's squadrons deployed on aircraft carriers, then that meant that I couldn't go. So I said, when a land-based squadron deploys overseas for operations, they deploy to another land base, so therefore the law does not apply. And they kind of went... <laughs> And I was nice, you know, I, I didn't burn my bra like lots of women were doing at the time. And I worked hard in school to prove that I could do it. And whenever the topic came up, I'd bring it up again. And they decided that they would send me. There was something about my personality that they thought I could handle being the only woman in an all-male organization. <laughs> so some of the problems uh, that I had was I put so much energy and to figure, you know, following my dream of being an intelligence officer, I didn't have any professional skills. Uh, I did not understand the uh, Im importance of ventures. I didn't know how to become a valuable part of the workplace in a hostile environment. I had to deal with conscious and unconscious bias. People doubted my credentials. I had uh, done a junior year abroad. I had a fellowship to a very prestigious graduate program that I dropped out of after one year in good standing to join the military. And so my dad came to my graduation ceremony, and we're standing there, and my, two of my instructors, oh, Gail did great. We can't tell you, but we had word from way, way up that she wasn't passed, even if she slept through all her classes, but she showed everybody. And, and later I said to my father, I said, Daddy, why didn't they think I could make it through the program? And, you know, he said, you know, that initially some of the doors may be closed to you because people have these attitudes, but if you work very, very hard, and when the doors open, and they will, you can come out soaring. So I always remembered that. And so when I got into the workplace, I found out that my first squadron, they wanted the honor of having the first woman but they didn't expect me to actually do anything. <laughs> what they wanted to do was to trot me out whenever the media was around. And anybody that knows me, I'm the kind of person you should hide when the media comes around. Because <laughs> you don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> so I called up my father. I couldn't understand. You know, I sat next to guys all the way through graduate school, and being a woman was not a problem. So I called up, I said, you know, why is it you, you get out of school and the next day,
people think you're incompetent only because of your sex. And so my father told me to get off the phone and stop whining. He said, everybody is prejudiced against something or some group. And everybody at some point experiences discrimination in the workplace. And I'm going to say something right now, because whenever I say that, you see some people, I'm not prejudiced. Or, ah. I'm going to say something right now that's going to cause some of you in this room to boo and hiss me. I am a lifelong Dallas Cowboy fan. <laughs> now you say, well, how can that be about prejudice? Well, when I was working at the United States Strategic Command, I had 500 people working for me. And one of the young officers was a football fan, and he claimed he was a Dallas Cowboy fan. So every Monday morning, I came into work in the middle of the night. So about every Monday, about maybe 9, he'd come in and spend about 15 minutes discussing how the Cowboys had done over the weekend. So I had a couple of the other junior officers come up to me and demand a meeting with me. They said, ma'am, Lieutenant so-and-so is sucking up to you. He's a terrible worker, and we're afraid you're putting him above us. You're favoring him. And I looked at him, and I said, you think I'm so dumb to know, not to know he's sucking up to me? <laughs> and they said, yeah, that made them feel better. But I thought about that. And as a leader, you really have to be careful. Uh, and here's how it can play out. Uh, there's going to be a time when you have to do professional evaluations or recommend promotions for people who work for you. So it's human nature. You know, say I have two Navy lieutenants and I have to rank them or recommend them for a job. Their performance is both equal. I have one that grew up in New Jersey, loves the Dallas Cowboys. I have another that grew up in Virginia and is a Redskin fan. Now, if I'm not careful, who am I more inclined to want to push forward? The person who has the most in common with me. And I think what I had to learn as a leader and manager as I rose up the chain is you have to identify your own biases, and we all have them. There was one instance, again, at United States Strategic Command. We had an opening for, think of it as the network command anchor the person who would give the presentations whenever VIPs came to town. Well, the person that was an Air Force general that I worked for, for whatever reason, he had a bias against guys with mustaches. I don't know about women with mustaches, but, <laughs> but guys with mustaches. And he said, I don't, if you pick somebody, you better not have a mustache. So I said, aye, aye, sir. And so it turned out the best guy for it had a mustache. So I asked him, nowadays I'd probably get in all kinds of trouble. I said, well, if we select you, would you be willing to, to shave your mustache? <laughs> and he said, yes. Can you see the evening news? <laughs> Captain Gail Harris made this man shave his face, even though it was within regulations for the job. <laughs> I never asked my boss, why do you hate guys with mustaches? But, I mean, it's, we laugh, but, you know, it, it can be kind of serious at times. And... History is a great teacher. You see, I'm looking here saying, all right, what's on that? Don't write somebody off because they're biased. I had uh, one person, uh, I, when I went to, the te to be a teacher at the Navy's Intelligence Training Center, uh, the first day, instead of welcome aboard, Gil, happy to have you, he said, I hope you're not going to be like the last woman I had work for me and demand that I keep a file cabinet full of feminine hygiene products. I can't tell you on this stage what my reply was. I'll tell you offline. But all I can say is he exhaled for about 10 minutes, didn't speak to me about a month. And then if you were to say, who helped me the most during my career, it would be Captain Drew Simpson, who grew up in Atlanta and idolized Robert E. Lee. He was my biggest admirer and supporter. So do not write somebody off because they might make an insensitive statement. In the historical examples, Earl Warren was Attorney General and then Governor of California when during World War II they put 120,000 Japanese Americans in concentration camps who had done nothing wrong other than being born Japanese after and had to deal with the hostility after the attack on Pearl Harbor. He said in his memoir he always felt 
horrible about that. And when he was selected as the Supreme Court Justice, in today's time, he never would have been selected. But he was then, and he was in charge of the Supreme Court for the Brown versus Bo uh, the Board of Education in Kansas, in Kansas City that ended uh, segregation in schools. George Wallace, governor of Alabama, standing in front of the admissions office at the University of Alabama screaming, you know, he wouldn't let in the black students. Segregation now, segregation forever. A few years later, he went unannounced to an NAACP meeting and apologized. And now, uh, my, both my parents were born in Alabama, and now whenever I watch the Alabama football team and I see all the African Americans, I smile. So don't write people off because as you go to the workplace, they say something insensitive. As silly as it may sound, sometimes people don't realize that what they're saying is offensive. And the way I dealt with things was uh, through humor. And my first assignment, because I was the first, uh, guys would look at me and refuse to salute, uh, you know, because they felt women didn't belong. I was walking across the base one day to go to lunch, and this young enlisted guy came up to me instead of saluting. He started screaming and yelling, you don't belong here. You're taking a job from a man. You need to go away. And I looked at him and I said, you know, you're absolutely right, but I come from a poor family. Nobody wanted to marry me. <laughs> you know, he didn't realize how offensive he was being. I think I, by my comment, made him think. Uh, I'll say one thing and then move on. I, I don't want to run. I want to hit some of these other points. I tend to run long. When the, the Marines, it's been in the news this week, that although some enlisted women Marines had, had passed when I decided to open up combat uh, jobs uh, to the women Marines, uh, the enlisted women passed the infantry training but 35 women officers, Marine women officers, tried and failed. Number 36 passed. And one of the things that they were saying about, you know, why women shouldn't be allowed to go into combat into the Army or the uh, Marines was they mentioned that women couldn't do pull-ups as part of the physical fitness test. And so I was at a conference uh, in San Diego about two years ago, and PBS had done a special about the women's auxiliary service pilots, the women during World War II who flew and delivered airplanes. They flew all types of airplanes. And thanks to Senator Barry Goldwater, they finally got their due. And so they're showing these women going through the training in the documentary. And here are these women who are our grandmothers and great-grandmothers in the audience, their feet way off the ground. <laughs> I said, maybe women today might have a problem, but obviously it's not. You know, look at these old ladies. <laughs> I was saying, you know, maybe I should call up the Commandant of the Marine Corps and say, watch that PBS special. Okay, uh, one of the other lessons learned was the importance of dreams and goals. And one of the things, and I think my journey proves it, your dream is waiting for you to come true. That deep-seated feeling of what you'd like to do uh, one question I ask people, what would you want to do if you knew you could not fail? Think about that. That tells you where your passion is. Well, how does that relate to the workplace? Well, what I would always do for every assignment is set the goals of what did I want to do, what did I want to achieve, personally and professionally. By personally, uh, if I had some shortcomings that I need to address. In my very first assignment, as I said, they didn't actually expect me to do anything. So I, one day I was at happy hour of all places, and one of the flight, a bunch of the flight crew guys, they said, you know, intelligence officers are worthless. You all sit there behind that closed door looking at all that information, and you don't share anything with us. You don't understand what the mission is. How can you support us if you don't know what we do? So what they suggested was each of the flight crew, before they'd actually show up at the squadron, would spend time in what is known as a replacement air group. That is, after their initial pilot training, then they would go train in the airplane that they would use. And for us, it was a P-3C. And the seriousness of this is, most people don't realize, but during the Cold War, 
the Soviet Union kept two submarines off our west coast, two submarines off our east coast, armed with nuclear-tipped ballistic missiles all the time. And so it was the mission of the P-3 squadrons, the primary mission, to keep track of these submarines so if the Cold War ever went hot, they could destroy them. So it was not any small task. So what they suggested, well, Gail, yeah, go through the first part of the replacement air group training. So I did. They accepted me. And I, I guess I was there about two months. And I, I learned, I had to learn all the equipment, not only the equipment, but what every button and lever did. And we had quizzes every week, and I flunked all the quizzes, primarily because I couldn't go flying to reinforce it. And the instructors are great. They, they said, Gail, what do you got to pass the quiz? You know, to pass the course, you could flunk the quiz, but you had to pass the final. I said, well, I'm going to keep training. And I said, could you give me some extra time in the trainer? I said, it's hard for me to, to put this in context without flying in the airplane. So they did. And they took time on the weekend and the evening to get in there with me. And I actually passed the final after flunking all the weekly quizzes. And at that point, the guys started inviting me to fly with them. And I hope this is no longer subject to punishment. I even flew the airplane once. <laughs> And they liked that, and it gave me a better sense as to what I needed to do to support them. And I flew all the time. I'm sorry I didn't keep records of how much I flew. And one time, I, I wanted to tell this story because of what's been in the news. Uh, during the Cold War, it was very common for the Soviet Union to do ballistic missile testing. And so we had over the Pacific. One time, I was in Hawaii in 19, late 1980s and uh, the re-entry vehicles from the missiles bracketed Hawaii. And somehow that made it in the press. It didn't normally make it in the press, and the Hawaiians going, ah, they're, they're practicing nuking us. And I thought, doesn't the public realize we're still, a, you know, we're in a Cold War with the Soviet Union? So they were getting ready to do one of their missile tests, and so we were sending a detachment to Midway Island. <laughs> and... They, the guys wanted me to fly with them. What we had to do was recognize the Soviets had some scientific ships to measure the launches. And we needed to know where they were because that would let us know where the reentry vehicles were coming in. And so as fate would have it, I had the, probably one of the worst cases of the flu and the crud that I'd ever had. And I was really sick. And the guy said, yeah, you got to come anyway. So I was uh, laying down on the, the cockpit and... They picked me up, and when we got close to the ship, they'd stick my face in the window. I'd tell them who it was, try not to throw up, and then they'd lay me back down. <laughs> I'm gonna, I've only got a few minutes. I want to I wanna be able to get to questions. Within you, what I learned was you had the seeds of greatness. Is uh, One of my favorite stories is uh, about this college student. He came in the class one day, and he saw two math programs on the blackboard, two problems. So he copied them down, went home, and it took him a while, but he solved them. And a few days later, it's Sunday, and there's a knock on his dorm room, and it's his instructor. He says, sir, what are you doing here? And he said, uh, George, you solved the problem. So he said, yeah, wasn't I supposed to? He said, those weren't extra credit problems. If you'd shown up on time, you would have known that those were two problems that historically never been able to, to, uh, to solve. George Danzig, they whip through. What I do in a workplace, each job, uh, develop a magnificent obsession. Do I have the skill set that I need and so forth? What do I need? Do I need to form a team? Uh, you know, what type of competencies do I have? Persistence, fail forward. You know, the Admiral mentioned, you know, one of the quotes that I have, I learned far more from my failures and how to do a better job than I did for my successes. If I had been successful in my first assignment, I don't think I ever would have been initially, I don't think I ever would have developed into a good intelligence officer. I had to work harder to fill those gaps. Know yourself. Sometimes you're the problem. Have a trusted friend to tell you if you're a jerk. <laughs> My biggest problem is my temper. I, you know, I don't scream and yell at people, but 99% of the time I could deal with some of the slights I had to endure as a woman with humor, but that 1% of the time I couldn't, and that's always when I ended up in the doghouse. So I have a, a game you call Ain't It Awful, 
which is a trusted friend you call, and when something's bad, the rules are they have to listen to you whine for 10 minutes. Then after 10 minutes, they can say, well, Gail, don't you think when you called that man up at home and cursed him out and then threw his coffee cup against the wall, that was a little bit extreme? <laughs> and that's an actual conversation. <laughs> right mental attitude. Before you can become a successful leader, you have to become a successful follower. In the Navy, the chiefs and the admirals run the Navy. And when you are a junior officer, for the civilian world, it's the administrative assistance to the senior people. They know everything. And if they like you, they'll make sure you get invited to the meetings you need to, and they will look out for you. And the Navy is the chiefs. And my first assignment, uh, at my lowest moment, uh, it, I was in my office crying, and there was a knock on the door, uh, and I opened it up. I, you know, wiped the tears away, shoulders back. I opened it up, and there was a crusty Navy chief. He said, ma'am, we chiefs have been talking. And we just want to let you know we think you're the best junior officer in the squadron. That's the only compliment I've received in three years. But I knew if the chief said it, it must be so. And for my second assignment, I was hand-selected for what was considered the best assignment that a junior officer could have based on the observed performance in that first assignment. Loyalty to the organization, like I said, I'm running out of time, so uh, I do want to be able to tell my final story that tells all this. Faith, you, this is multi-layered. You have to believe you can do it in terms of the tasks that you have at hand. There are no impossible problems. My dad always said two things you can do about a problem something or nothing. And what I found was 100% of the problems that I encountered in the military in terms of job tasks, and I think this last story I'll tell you kind of illustrates that. The other thing that I'll say, Abraham Lincoln said he was often driven to his knees when he had no place else to go. And what I tell people, one of the things you need to do is have a philosophy of life for yourself to put things into context when things aren't going well. For me, I was raised in a, as a Methodist. Went away from that, but came back later in life. That worked for me, but I'm into tolerance. Whatever, I have friends that are into meditation, into yoga, into whatever works for you. I think that's one of, whether it's the force, like in the Star Wars movies. And nobody can tell you or should tell you what that can be. If it hadn't been for that when I was at my lowest moments, that's what I fell back on. So this, I, I'll leave my notes with you all. Uh, the last lesson learned that I'll tell you about before concluding is mentors. You need to have somebody mentor you at all stages of your career. If somebody doesn't volunteer, you go up and ask them. And don't be afraid. People are very flattered if you ask them to mentor you. And I remember one time when I was teaching at the Navy's Intelligence School, I also decided I had dropped out of the Navy after my first, out of uh, graduate school after my first year to join the Navy. And so when I got sent back to the school to teach the Navy's Intelligence School, it was in Denver. And so I wrote the University of Denver a grovel, grovel letter to let me back because seven years had passed. And they did. So I didn't, I was working full time, so did not have time to hang out with the students. But one day one of the students came out. She said, I'm working on my PhD in Soviet studies and I can't find anything on the Soviet military. I understand you're a naval intelligence officer. Can you help me out? So I said, sure. Met with her a time or two, given her the background, everything she needed to know. The military, the intelligence community had some unclassified publications. I gave that to her. And I always remember this. The last time I saw her leaving, I said, there's something about that Condoleezza Rice. Okay, this is, I'll end and hopefully have time left for questions. The greatest collaboration story ever told, never told. And this, I think, handle, it includes all the lessons learned. Uh, for my last assignment, and this will happen, what I found is I got senior as a woman, the attacks against my character came harder and furious. And somebody started the rumor that I was a drunken tramp. Now, anybody that knows me knows my drink of choice is Coca-Cola. And if three or four dates make a year makes me a tramp, so be it. 
<laughs> but unfortunately, as I hope most of you will not have to go through this in the younger generation, once people find out stuff like that, they use that as an excuse to professionally blackball you. So I didn't have time to talk much about Bloom Where You Plant It, but the bottom line is you never know what uh, job experience will be a defining moment for you. So always work the hardest, even if you think it's not a good deal. So my last assignment was at United States Space Command. In December 1998, President Clinton gave cyber a mission, a military mission. And so I, when I showed up at the command to show you that they didn't even want me, I had no office, no job assignment, no phone. So I went to my boss and I said, you know, in 28 years I've never filed an equal opportunity complaint. I'm going to go to Brazil on vacation. And when I come back, if this situation isn't solved, I'm filing a complaint against you all. And so I came back, and by this time they'd had the mission for two years, and people thought from the intelligence perspective it was a horrible job. First off, most of the senior Navy, most of the senior intelligence agencies, to include the three-letter folks, did not believe that cyber was an intelligence problem. They thought it was a, a problem for the technicians, for the communications, the IT people. And the other thing was they didn't think they'd get the intelligence community all at the time, 16 organizations, and 17 now, counting the Director of National Intelligence, to agree on anything. So they said, Gail, we're going to make you the lead for the intelligence community for this project. And my boss told me that, but he didn't tell anybody else that. So as I would go, I'd call up NSA or CIA and say, oh, you know, I'm Captain Harris, and I'd like to come to discuss your concerns about cyber. They'd blow me off and send, give me, like, maybe the most junior person. But I followed all my lessons learned. I found people to mentor me, and I studied. And then finally, uh, one person suggested, Gail, yeah, why don't you have a conference and invite people here to solve things for you? So I did, and I had uh, the second in command from Space Command send out the invitation. If I'd sent it, they would have ignored it. And I'd identified three problems that should have been solved two years ago. First off, under what circumstance would the intelligence community, as opposed to the IT community, report on a cyber incident? The second thing was that we needed to be able to share information and all of these problems are still problems today, but we made, as you'll see, we made some, some progress. So sharing information. Uh, for instance, I found out that the FBI was only sharing about 40% of cyber incidents with the intelligence community. When I asked why, they reminded me that the intelligence community could not spy on U.S. citizens. And I said, yes. I said, I'm not asking you to spy. I don't have to know that John Doe, who lives at 417 18th Avenue, hacked into a bank in Newark, New Jersey. What I do need to know is the incident and the nature of the cyber tools used against it, because I'm looking for patterns. What may look like an attack by an individual could be an attack by a nation state. And we have had countries like Iran and North Korea, for instance, attack our systems. And then the third thing is what type of information does the intelligence community need to collect in order to be able to do our job? If you don't ask for the information, you won't get it. So people showed up, and I came on the stage. I asked my boss who was setting up. I said, can I have 10 minutes? He looked at me suspiciously and said, Gail, what do you want to talk about in 10 minutes? Oh, I just want to tell them where the bathroom is and... Stuff like that. And he kind of, he says, okay. So I got up there, and I said, and this is a true story. In 1989, there was an earthquake in Armenia that was 8.2 on the Richter scale. In the first four minutes, 40,000 people died. So there was a man, he and his wife were okay, but their home was destroyed. So he took his wife over to his neighbor and said, would you watch my wife? And his neighbor said, where are you going? He said, my son, his eight-year-old son, was in school. I'm going to go see, get my son. And his neighbor said, your place is here. Look at this destruction. You know, you can't even make it to the school location. And he looked at him, and he said, you don't understand. I told my son that no matter what happened to him in life, I would be there for him. So he goes over to the school. It's flattened like a pancake. 
and there are parents standing around there crying. So he looks at them and he said, are you going to help me? And they said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm going to start digging this out. And they said, do you hear anything? Do you hear anybody screaming or crying? Nobody could have survived this. So he ignored them and he looked at the geography. He knew the location of his son's classroom and he started digging. So the firemen came by and they tried to stop him. And he'd stop for a second and say, are you going to help me? And he'd go back and dig. And this kept happening. 12 hours, 18 hours, 20 hours, 24 hours. Finally, on the 37th hour, he came across an air pocket. And he yelled into that air pocket. And he heard his son's voice. So he said, Armin, what's your condition? And his son said, Dad, of my... I can't get through this. Of my 33 classmates, there are 14 of us still alive. And I kept telling everybody to hold on. We have no water, we have no food. But I said, my dad will come for us. So he said, son, give me your hand. And he said, no, dad, let the others go first, because I know you'll be here for me. So I turned to this auditorium full of hardened warriors. And I say, the reason we're here today is I don't care what you hear about operational success and intelligence failures. The intelligence community has been there to support the warfighter since the dawn of time. Today, this week, I'm going to start digging. Are you going to help me? And in one week, we solved problems that they'd not been able to solve for the preceding two years. So I say to you, the women who are carrying forward the charge and the men who are here to support them. There are no impossible problems. There is always a solution. One team, one fight. And I hope that you say when you think you can't do it, you look at your team and say, are you going to help me? Thank you. And you can't embarrass me. Can't embarrass me. But I'm going to point something out for I know, you know, the Dallas Cowboys fan, right? Yes, they won this week. The guy who sacked and turned it off on me. Turned it off on me. <laughs> the guy who sacked. The Arizona quarterback three times. Did you watch that? Yes, I did. Boise State University graduate. Yay, Broncos! Give me those questions. We can only do football so much here. <laughs> All right. Okay, I missed this part of your talk, but it looks like it, people would be interested. Tell us more about the Broadway musicals. What about what music? Well, it's uh, the story of how my parents met. And uh, I guess back in the day, there are certain topics families didn't talk about. And it was uh, love at first sight from my mother. She had, was uh, taking the laundry uh, and she saw this really attractive man and she dropped her laundry and he came over to help her pick it up. And so she went home to her family and told her best friend, her, my mom was the youngest of 12, so she had nieces and nephews her age. And, and she said, I've just met the man I'm going to marry. Oh, oh. And at that point, uh, my, her father hadn't seen his, old, his younger brother in 25 years, so he came back with his new wife and his family. And so when my mom is saying that, uh, my father walks up, and his, his father says, oh, here's my other son, Jimmy. And her cousin said, you fell in love with your first cousin. That's twisted. <laughs> <laughs> and my father had some, you know, the old, younger brother invited the older brother up to New Jersey from Alabama where they were living. And so finally at that point, my father said, I'm not supposed to tell you, but your uncle is only my stepfather. So I thought that would make a great story. <laughs> Captain, so... Was there ever a time when you wanted to give up, and what kept you going? Every six months. <laughs> you know, I would uh, crawl home, uh, you know, think that I had missed a mark, that I hadn't done my job properly. 
And what there were several things that made me go keep going. I call up my father, and you know he kind of give me you know some advice and how to navigate the workplace, tell me to stop whining. And the other uh, was my faith, you know my my religious belief. Uh, I tell a story at my lowest point. I was at United States Strategic Command, and we were providing support uh, for combat operations. Uh, in Iraq and also in Kosovo. And I put in place, since my people normally didn't uh, work Iraq or Kosovo, if they felt they found a target that we needed to bomb or hit cruise missiles against, to check with the intelligence people in, in Washington, D.C., because they had more experience. And I came in one day to find out that uh, they hadn't checked in one instance and killed 13 Iraqi farmers and their farm animals. And what bothered me, in addition to the fact that those innocent people were killed, was the fact that uh, I had some enemies that spread the rumor that I tried to cover it up. And in fact, I even ended up under investigation. And what, what they call a non-punitive counseling letter it doesn't go in your record, but it's a punch in the mouth. And my mom and I had been reading this uh, religious book where this guy kept having these experiences. And they always happen at 4.44 in the morning. And so as I was leaving, I was getting ready to transfer to Colorado, and I, my mom, she made me buy a cell phone so she could call up and scream at me, you're not having faith in God. If you did, you wouldn't be depressed over this. I'm going. <laughs> I said, Mommy, you know, I just, an hour ago, can I at least grieve between Omaha and Colorado as I'm driving? She said, no. So as I'm leaving the base, uh, I look, you know, those uh, signs, those electronic signs that flash the date and time. As I'm driving, and le larger than I'd ever seen was the time 444. And the fact that I'm standing here showed that I overcame that. So this one, this one I think is on the country's mind a little bit. And it's a little bit of a football question, but really not. What, what are your thoughts about the NFL players taking a knee during the national anthem? That's what I put my life on the line for. My attitude is I may not believe, agree with what you say or what you do, but I will defend my right for you to, the right for you to do that with my life. Probably a better answer than the president gave. <laughs> no, Remember, for those of us of a certain <laughs> age, when Muhammad Ali wouldn't go to Vietnam, I think he did jail time, and now people respect him for taking a stand. So we have to that historical perspective. We don't know what's right or wrong sometime until the history path time passes. Now, this this is a, a great question because it also. Speaks